Well, that's just bad parenting right there. You promise your kid you're going to be taking her to McDonald's for dinner. You don't renege. It just leads to resentment. Larry Fessenden and Rob Coons are here to talk about their new documentary focused on Night of the Living Dead. Come on inside. Around about the end of the 1960s, a young filmmaker in Pittsburgh decided he was ready to move on past the world of TV commercials and into the larger field of feature film. He came up with an idea that he thought would introduce him as a new vision in the field. Unfortunately, backers weren't all that interested in a moody drama called Wine of the Fawn, and so George Romero went back to the drawing board, said, Maybe they'd be interested in cannibalistic corpses and, of course, came up with Night of the Living Dead. There's now a new documentary about the making of that film and its impact culturally, politically, and socially. The film is called Birth of the Living Dead. deal of sort of anger you know I think mostly that the 60s didn't work it was a sense of chaos and sense of tension which means things were going to change so I invented these characters persons who have recently died have been returning to life that's Romero speaking from the times about a bleakness the culture was suffering and we just wanted to make a ballsy a horror film as we could make I don't think audiences were ready for Night of the Living Dead. And I think that's why they were drawn to it. The sheer excitement of seeing a movie like that. It scared me to death. You know, it felt like this generational shift in filmmaking. And at first, people had no faith that we could actually make a movie. They were able to say, it looks like a movie. And we said, well, that's what we're trying to tell you. One of these days, it's going to grow up to be a movie. It was this tiny little movie in Pittsburgh. It seemed to have no chance. And it, you know, changed the world. Are they slow moving, Chief? Yeah, they're dead. They're all messed up. <laughs> <laughs> Joining us to talk about Birth of the Living Dead are its director, Rob Coons, and its executive producer, the omnipresent Larry Fessenden. You get around, Larry. <laughs> Living legend. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so, um, let me start off by going all Stephen Colbert on your ass. Um, Night of the Living Dead, one of the most influential films, horror films of the past 50 years, or the most influential horror film of the past 50 years? That's a, it's a valid question. I, I, I'd be hard pressed to think of one that's more influential. Why do you think that is? Well, it, it, changed, the, uh, it, it changed the face of horror, basically. And, uh, and I, a wonderful book that explores this is Jason Zinneman's Shock Value. And uh, we interviewed Jason Zinneman in the, uh, in the documentary. And something which uh, he actually doesn't go into in the documentary specifically, but he went into in the book, was that the uh, the horror film, the, the name above the title in, the, in horror films used to be Bela Lugosi, Boris Karloff, Vincent Price. That was the monster. George A. Romero changed all of that. After Night of the Living Dead, it was Wes Craven, John Carpenter, David Cronenberg, John Landis, and, and George A. Romero. They were the monsters that you had to be afraid of. Larry, what about you? What do you think about its influence? Um, well, I'm often asked what's my favorite horror movie, and uh, I I cite that film. It, to me, it's the fulcrum between the old black and white films, and of course, then the the, the color films as well from the '60s. But truly, the uh, old Universal movies where there were uh, you know zombies, I mean uh, vampires and werewolves, and then um, 
a roundabout Romero's film is when everything changed and it's a much bleaker vision and it sort of reestablished the true uh, horror that uh, that can disarm an audience. I think people were becoming very comfortable with horror archetypes. It was really almost an entertainment for children by the 60s because by then it was uh, uh, the old movies were on television and they were turning into serials and uh, toys and so it took a film like Night of the Living Dead to shake things up. So to me it's the fulcrum that took us into the, the modern era of uh, of scary films. Mm -hmm. So why uh, why do the documentary now? What motivated you? Well, I, I had been a fan of George A. Romero's and, uh, and came across a book called The Zombies That Ate Pittsburgh by Paul Gagne, uh, which is a wonderful book. I think it's still out of print. I, I hope it comes back into print. Uh, but uh, it goes into uh, you know his his actually his childhood and how he made his first films at like age 14, 15. And um, and the story of making the story of the making Night of the Living Dead was just this wonderful kind of underdog story. Essentially, it was a little movie that could that came out of an underdog city, Pittsburgh. These twenty six, twenty seven year olds, along with uh, well, I guess it was all ages really, because he had the roller rink owner Vince <laughs> Serminsky, who also got involved, which is a wonderfully inspiring story. So it started out essentially as this you know incredible story of this little movie that came out of Pittsburgh that ended up like changing the world and changing the genre. Uh, but as I worked, um, I was working for Bill Moyer's journal at the time, and uh, as an editor, uh, while I was editing this uh, this film, and uh, and I got steeped into uh, the the times in which Night of the Living Dead was made, and came across and had to work with for for the show for Moyer's show all of this archival footage of the race rebellions that were going on at the time of Vietnam and how America was really taking a good hard look at itself. There was a real kind of cultural revolution going on at the time. And it seemed as if, um, uh, the, it, as I started just as, as an editor cross-cutting uh, scenes from the film and, and the making of the film, realizing that as they were making the film, these race rebellions were going on, it was just this fascinating kind of juxtaposition. And of course, didn't have to dig very far in research and reading to say this has indeed been explored very richly and just became this great kind of expansion of the concept of where the documentary could go. Larry, how did you become involved with the documentary? I don't really remember. Where, where you, did you invite me to interview? I did, yeah. A friend of mine, uh, Matt Huffman, who has acted in a couple of the films that, that, that you produced, uh, said, you know who you should interview is Larry Fessenden. And Larry, I've been a fan of Larry's for a long time. And uh, so that was just this, I, I, just as an opportunity to meet Larry and to, and to interview him was, uh, was this fabulous opportunity. It turned out, I didn't know this, Night of the Living Dead is a huge influence on Larry. It's his favorite horror film. And so he was just this explosion you know, of, of information and inspiration. And it was just, it, the, the process of the interview was just one of the, probably the, one of the most fun I've ever had in my, in my whole life was interviewing Larry. So I did the interview and that was fun. And then Rob followed up and said, do you want to look at a cut? And when I watched the film as it was uh, in at the time, I, I was so inspired because my great uh, premise with horror is how essential it is in expressing national anxieties. And uh, I felt that Rob, um, it's unusual because horror fans just want to get to the, the gore and so on, but I'm really interested in how horror functions in uh, the cultural uh, environment and it, how it shows the sign of the times from which it comes. And, uh, and so this movie really expressed that. And um, it reminded me of a book, uh, David Skull, is that the, the, the Monster Show, mm -hmm. which really uh, charts horror through the last century in American culture and how the uh, different periods of, of history uh, result in different sort of modes of horror. For example, the, the classic Godzilla films and giant ants from them are, are during the anxieties about the atom bomb and, and this sort of thing. And Rob's film really captivated that um, that essential uh, discussion, and and so then I uh, I offered a few other ideas for interviewees, and we started working together um, to to take the film to its completion. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, Larry does make a good point, which is something that I also subscribe to. That really uh, the film that really the films that really reflect the anxieties of the society at the time. Mm -hmm. You can't find better than horror films. Yeah. And so it, w what struck me about Birth of the Living Dead is that it isn't just about the making 
of the film. It is also about this political impact. How did you go about working um, that theme, keeping that present in the film? Well, I, I had I had Larry's uh, basically through the interviews, essentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's uh, I, all the ideas really came from the interviews. And uh, Larry, uh, Mark Harris was also a big uh, a big influence uh, on how the film was shaped. He wrote a, a wonderful book called Pictures at a Revolution, uh, which uh, which looked at the films that were nominated in 1967, a time that that, that night was made uh, for the Academy Award, and placed those movies in the socio political context, uh, including you know two films that starred Sidney Poitier, and of course race is a is a big issue. Uh, you know Romero and his company would say accidental theme in the film, but nevertheless a potent one and something very present. And uh, and so Mark was able to you know basically just take the titles that he had you know Doctor Doolittle, um, Bonnie and Clyde, um, what of the Graduate. I mean I, I kind of look at in reading his book I was looking at Night of the Living Dead as like the working class cousin of Bonnie and Clyde and the Graduate. You know it's just as influential, just as kind of earth shaking, and uh, and so between and also Elvis Mitchell who. I was delighted to find out, saw the film at age 10 at a drive-in in Detroit soon after the, uh, the race rebellions in Detroit had basically destroyed the, the city. Uh, so here's this, you know, this African-American kid, 10 years old, watching this film and it having a huge influence on him as well. So the stuff, everything just kind of came out organically through the interviews, uh, which was just really exciting. And I think Romero himself, I mean, it's no... Uh it's no secret that his movies have that metaphorical mm -hmm. component. Uh, whether he wanted to address racism directly is, is, of course, up for debate because he hadn't planned to cast Dwayne Jones. But uh, in every other way, his movies, as he continued his career, uh, the, the zombies are... There's a, there's a metaphor at play. And when you listen to him, he's very humble and very charming, but he clearly is, uh, you know, he's got a, a political opinion and he was uh, of his time. And he wanted to make a difference, and um, so I think it all stems from George's movie and his agenda. And that I just think it's refreshing to see Rob sort of put that out uh, as a, a theme of a documentary about the making of a little scary film. <laughs> it, it was very interesting because one of the uh, uh, the lines running through the film, at least with the people who were involved with it directly was whether once they did make that casting decision whether they should address the race issue or mm -hmm. not and it, it, right. it, it, it's an interesting tension about how they sort of tread the line of are we doing this aren't we doing this what are we going to do about this yeah and the fact that Dwayne Jones himself had a de debate you know according to Romero with with Romero about uh, about you know this this is uh, this is potent stuff that we're putting on screen. Here I am actually having physical contact with a white blonde woman that wasn't heard of, you know, in movies at that time. Why don't you see if you can find some wood, some boards, something about the fireplace, something we can nail this place up. Oh, God, that... Look, I know you're afraid. I'm afraid too. But we have to try to board the house up together. Now, I'm going to board up the windows and the doors. Do you understand? We'll be all right here. We'll be all right here until someone comes to rescue us. It was like, what was it around that time? Harry Belafonte and I think Petula? Clark. Clark, yeah. Right. yeah. Or, or the, uh, the Kirk and Uhura kiss right. on Star Trek. Same thing. So. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and equally important. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> also groundbreaking. <laughs> I'd like to actually. I'd like to back up a little bit in terms of one of my answers, if I if I yeah, may. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I you know I am not I'm not giving enough uh, uh, I'm not giving enough attention. I think to Romero. Obviously, he's in terms of in my answers uh, in terms of his influence on the documentary. He's where it all started. When, in talking about how the the film gets got started and how I got interested, uh, it was uh, from after reading. Uh, that book and uh, Zombie City of Pittsburgh and, and other there was a Senate Fantastic article in mm -hmm. fact uh, about the about the making of Night of the Living Dead which was so fascinating to me uh, a friend of my, my wife Esther who uh, produced the film with me she couldn't be here I'm afraid but uh, but my wife Esther and I um, have a have a mutual friend of a mutual friend of George Romero's it's Pat Buba and Zilla Clinton they were uh, Pat was uh, 
an editor who worked with uh, who worked with George. He cut Monkey Shines, and also was one of the uh, the psycho uh, motorbike guys in in Dawn of the Dead. And it was his house where they shot Martin, which is you know one of my favorite all time George Romero movies. So he's obviously very close with George. Zilla Clinton was the uh, production manager for Dawn of the Dead, so it was you know awesome to meet them. Uh, our friend Chiz Schultz connected us with with, uh, with Pat and Zilla in LA. We had dinner with them, and it was through them that we got connected to George. And uh, and jo we interviewed George in, um, at his apartment in Toronto. He was just unbelievably gracious to us and just gave us all of his time, and it was, a, it was just an amazing experience. I wanted to ask you about that, because I interviewed George Romero for one of the later dead films. I think it was The Ragged Cuticles of the Dead or, or something <laughs> like that. It was, it was the last film. I don't remember the title. He's, he's a great interview. But I was wondering, you know, we, we, this, when I was talking to him, it was about the new film, so I could tailor my questions to that. You're talking to him about Night, and I remember I had done an interview with uh, Roger Corman, um, you know, and I tried to tailor my questions so, like, it's not the standard stuff, and everything I threw at Roger Corman, he had a canned answer ready, and I was just wondering, I mean, um, you know, he must have answered just about every question about night so how did you how did you handle that well i asked a lot of the same questions in, in the middle of it oh you guys all ask the same questions god damn <laughs> so, i mean he, no, he, he was really i mean he, he he stuck with us for, and it was just i think it was just in spending so much time with him you know we spent days with him and and i think that after a while things just kind of get broken down uh, you know, and and you could penetrate a little bit further. And uh, I surprised him with a lot of the biographical stuff. I was planning on getting into. We were planning on getting into also a lot of his earlier life because I just I I love the fact that he made films at age 15. You know, it's kind of amazing. Was he was interested in it from that point, and and came from such a humble background in the Bronx. Uh, and I was I wanted to make that part of the the documentary. It didn't make it in the actual documentary itself, but it is in the. There's a really wonderful. Uh, special feature in the DVD that will be coming out, which is an extended interview with George Romero, which gets into a lot of the stuff that we couldn't quite fit into the documentary. But it's it's just incredibly charming. And anyway, I'm I'm, I'm very excited about that particular feature. Uh, so I think it was just a question of spending time with him and him being unbelievably graciously willing to do that for us. That uh, that we that we went beyond that. Larry, were the things in the film that uh, the documentary that you didn't know? About uh, about night. Um, well, I think it's the cumulative effect of seeing all the different components, uh, like uh, a little veering aside to discuss Belafonte, and just being reminded of where everything was historically. I think those were the elements, and then you see uh, Roger Ebert's uh, reaction to the film. So it's it's the cumulative effect. Uh, you sort of know a lot of this if you've read articles or books about the film. Um, but to have it all combined and to, to have it be about the movie, about the... I mean, we're not also speaking about the film itself, which is worth analyzing, and Rob takes uh, a number of the interviews. I think one of your questions was to sort of invite uh, the interviewee to express their experience watching the movie. So there's this nice narrative uh, period in the film where you're kind of following the story, which is very familiar to those who've seen it a couple times and um, so uh, it wasn't so much that there was a specific new revelation it was just to see everything laid out together and sort of butted up with each other the, the race riots into the I mean the imagery of um, you know the, the, the vigilantes who are killing the zombies intercut with real footage of uh, race riots it's, it's quite remarkable and you realize how it must have felt to see it I mean I'm not I saw it around that time. It was what the culture was going on. Um, also, to see Vietnam footage and to realize that they were filming war footage with movie cameras uh, and shaky cam, uh, all these things were very fresh and startling, and that was what was on TV when I was very little. And, uh, and so much of Night of the Living Dead was shot in that kind of run-and-gun style, which gave it that, that new kind of re ultra-realistic sort of look that audiences weren't used to in horror films at the time. Yeah, so you really realize how essential this movie was and how raw and, and shocking, and I think that uh, it was just 
that's the effect of Birth of the Living Dead to really revisit all of that and see it all in, in one context. It's, it's a great ride. So what do you think the legacy of Night of the Living Dead is? Is, is it still as impactful a film now as it was then? <laughs> well, that's debatable. I have a kid who's 13. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's already been exposed to uh, Walking Dead and mm -hmm. uh, a couple of more recent zombie films and I did show it to him I don't know if it was the right atmosphere but he wasn't fully convinced <laughs> um, but I, you know I also believe that that could, could could watch it two years later and sort of find find an appreciation so I think the bottom line is that it still has it's the simplicity of the structure and some of those things the time stamp that it's really almost in real time those are the elements that I think make it a classic apart from its time and apart from some of the things we've been talking about just structurally I mean it's a it's a very fine little uh, piece and I think that's part of its charm I, I think uh, addressing Larry's uh, experience with Jack I think that the uh, if yet perhaps if there is a single mission to define what birth of the living dead is about it's about trying to immerse the audience uh, in that time so that they can experience the film with that sort of freshness. Uh, and so, somehow, I, the, when, when you juxtapose all the, the images and, you can, and, and the, the music is in the style of the time, when, when, if you can really kind of feel yourself in 1967, 68, uh, the, the film has all that much more impact. Uh, so that that's what we're that, that is one thing if there was one thing I was going for with the uh, with the documentary it, it was that to try and give, give the sense of your experience in the film for the first time in 1968 and I think that birth also I mean it's so rich because then it takes you to you start seeing the posters of the other movies of the time like Taxi Driver and um, well just all this array of 70s classics and you really once again, you're, you're reminded that this film preceded those and yeah. somehow led to those and related and, and brought Grindhouse to the mainstream briefly, you know, during the 70s and the auteurs that came up and suddenly filmmaking was about the director's vision. All these elements right. uh, were in play in that film. Plus, it's also, it's a triumph of independent filmmaking. I mean, uh, never mind Sundance and all of that. This was sort of before that. This is when you actually, these guys broke away from the normal method of making a film, which is to go knock on Hollywood's door, and they made a film in the East Coast with the money they gathered. For outrageously her. ballsy thing yeah. to do. <laughs> I mean, now we so once again, I think Rob wants to remind people that even that was remarkable. Now, with everybody having a cell phone camera, they could make a film, of course. But this was all very ballsy. Um, you know, I've been watching. Um, a lot of films from the period, uh, The Wicker Man, which was actually rather later, but Wicker Man and um, Wake and Fright and those. And what strikes me is that films of that period have a, a, a certain primal energy Absolutely. that I don't think gets captured in film. I don't know why it's so much harder now than that there is something about the time in the yeah. 70s, you know, and, and the fact that, uh, you know, Larry was talking about the great films that came out of the 70s, which, which Knight preceded. I mean, I, I, I'm not alone in that being my absolute favorite time of filmmaking periods, you know, in, in American history. And part of it is that quality of, of primal impact. Well, impressive. I feel that at that time in the culture, the culture was responding to the real events and there was a debate that was going on in the arts and perhaps you could say in politics. There was a genuine instinct to see if we could fix things. There was a little bit of the shattered American dream. Mm -hmm. People woken up and then you know the kids were fighting there was uh, the, the sex uh, the wars or whatever we're calling it you know there was a real tumult and the arts were engaged with that and we just we don't have that anymore everything's been co-opted from rock and roll to to the movies and you know this isn't to just be I mean there's still some vital filmmaking going on but it, it has a different context everybody wants to be noticed now yeah. it's not about everybody wants to solve this problem right it's that everybody wants a piece of of the, right. the fame and the action and that's yeah, that's just where we are in the times so there's a vitality that's missing in the culture i mean god knows we have infighting in washington of course but it none of it seems connected to anything it seems like posturing uh as if we're post solving problems in our culture and now we're just everybody's trying to get the last dregs be it fame or 
political success. And one of the things that's interesting <laughs> is that, I mean, there's no question, for, in my mind, that, you know, you go to the film festivals these days, and there's a sense of, you know, there's a mercenary sense, I think, to so many of the films. It's, it's trying to get a piece of the action, as, as Larry put it. That's what Romero and his company were trying to do. <laughs> which is so, you know, which is so funny and interesting is how, how they made something that was so insightful, that that was so political without being overtly political, which made its message all that all that much more powerful, in a purely, as they would say, mercenary goal mm -hmm. of trying to make a film that would make money, that would then interest Pittsburgh investors, so that they could go on to make other films. But yeah, I mean, that's what's funny, though. It does. It speaks to the culture itself because the way you made a difference was you engaged with the sure. culture and mm -hmm. you I mean I'm sure they would say well no we were making a zombie movie or a flesh eater movie but uh, it's so there, there's still a different way to engage whereas yeah. Uh, yeah of course everybody wanted a piece of the pie Scorsese wasn't an altruist you know he wanted to <laughs> you know, it. be a filmmaker make it but as a, it, to, to coin a phrase it is called show business after all <laughs> <laughs> So, Birth of the Living Dead, out now. Rob, Larry, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks thank so, so much.